care video for how I personally look after my Lacerta's. I've had Sol and Luna now for three years and this is their second year breeding. I've changed their setup several times throughout the year and I'm sure that, like, that this won't be their permanent setup forever. I'll end up changing something down the line. Um, so this is just how I currently do it and I'm quite happy with it at the moment. So firstly, their enclosure. This is one that I ended up making myself. Um, it's 80 centimetres deep, 120 centimetres wide and 60 centimetres tall. I found that if I did it any shorter than that, there ended up not being a lot of climbing space for branches because of all of the substrate that they end up using. Um, I also find it really handy having ventilation at the bottom, at the front, because um, that way it stops it getting a build up of heat here um, and it just makes it a whole lot easier to keep the top part hot, bottom part cooler. I generally try and fill mine with quite a lot of stuff because they do seem to like that. Um, they like having somewhere that they can just run to and hide at any point. Um, this is more empty than I want it to be, but that's because I'm waiting for the plants to grow. There was, I think, about seven originally, um, and they have slowly died. There's about, I think there's like four, yeah, there's, there's four still remaining, and I'm hoping that they still end up living. But um, that one in the corner, Luna keeps digging up. I usually come in and it's like upside down. So it's still alive though, it's still trying to go. You just keep trying to stop it. Don't know why. In the past, I've also used the sides for climbing walls and stuff. That really helps with um, increasing how much overall like space they have that they can use. I was originally planning to do it with this one, but I ended up running out of time for other reasons. And I was like, I'll just get it finished and at least it's, it's usable because it is still a big space, even if the sides aren't covered. For heating, um, I have, I think it's a 100 watts solar flowed basking bulb. Um, sometimes I lower the wattage if it's like really hot in the summertime and I find that it's getting too hot during like in the cold areas. Um, but most of the year it's the same wattage. There's a lot of variation in how people do the temperatures for the Lacertas. What I judge it on is the region they are naturally from. Um, which is the blue part on this picture and then I just chose a place at random like in the middle of that area somewhere that wasn't a city because the fact it's a city can affect the temperature and make it rise then this website gives really good information about the air temperature in that region so you want your air temperature to be anywhere between the minimum and the maximum there um, maybe a bit lower just so that they can't possibly overheat and then the surface temperatures i keep it as like a variety i like have some spots that are lower down and some that are higher up so they can choose how close they want to be to the heat source and then they just manage it themselves a good way of knowing if the setup's doing well for them is to just see how long they're basking for like i'll add a link to a time lapse of just a a recording of a whole day of what Sol and Luna do. Um, it's just a random day from sunrise to sunset. Um, so if you want an example of how much time they spend basking and how much they don't, then that is one example. They don't have any nighttime heating, um, even though this garage doesn't have a great deal of like actual heating. But if I really need to, then I'll just put on some other basking bulbs overnight that um, are in tanks that aren't being used. Generally, because they're burying themselves in the substrate anyway, um, the inside of their tanks stay warmer and the substrate kind of insulates them. Um, it's a lot more important with the babies that it doesn't go below like 15 degrees every night. Um, but they do need that fluctuation that they would normally get where there will be a temperature drop overnight. So the easiest way that I know how cold it's got through the night or how hot it's got while I've been at work um, is just using one of these. Um, 
it records like the highest and the lowest temperature, the highest and the lowest humidity. Um, it's really handy. Um, they're only about a tenner, so they're definitely worth getting. I tend to end up accidentally destroying them by pouring water on them when I'm watering the plants. So I've gone through a lot. Yeah, with the adults, sometimes it gets as cold as like five degrees in this room at night time in the winter. But I still find that they're okay because inside the tank stays warmer and inside the soil and around the rocks and stuff stay hotter as well. And with them being adults, they are just sturdier than with the babies. So because I've got a bioactive setup, I have two plant lights in, um, which are those two. They aren't reptile plant lights, they're just normal plant lights. I could be wrong, but I couldn't find any difference between a normal plant light and a reptile plant light, apart from the huge price difference. I haven't had any issues with the ones I'm using now. The plants seem to like them, even though they keep dying still, but I think that's a mixture of me and Luna's fault. Um, I have cages on all three of them, like the heat bulb and the plant lights, because no matter what you do, the lasers will end up climbing onto all the lighting. And they would like the plant lights do get hot, so it's best to just be safer and put cages on all of them so that there's no burns. I've never bothered with any cages for the UVB. Um, I just it doesn't get that hot. It gets warm but not hot. Um, the UVB that I use is um, the full length of the tank rather than, I know it's some reptile guides it says to do like 75% of the tank. I just use the full tank because there's a huge amount of shaded areas that they can go in if they don't want to be around the UV. Um, like <laughs> there's so much of the tank area that it can't be seen from here because they dig loads of tunnels and stuff um, as well as all of that log is hollow. The strength UVB that I use is basically the strongest one like anything that would be recommended for a bearded dragon is fine for a lacerta I find. Because they do climb on them um, I try and get ones with like a sturdy fitting because especially with like the bigger male ones they can use their heads as crowbars and like wedge they can just like pull the UV out the fitting. Um, if I have issues with that happening, I just try and attach like a cable tie just to secure it a bit better. Um, I have had it where Sol has totally destroyed a fitting before and all I've done is just used like a cable tie with one of the nails that you'd usually use to attach the wires to the ceiling. I put one of those in and then I loop a cable tie through it and it works just as well. I keep the lights on for, in the winter, it's like nine hours a day, um, unless they're brew mating, and in which case, sometimes I end up turning all their heating off, um, especially if they're in the house where it's already a heated house. In here, I just kept their heating on anyway, because otherwise it's absolutely freezing. Um, but during the summer it's like 14 hour days and things if i'm not sure how much lighting they should have for the time of year i just judge it on whatever the spanish daytime is at this current time um and since that's mostly where they're from like you can't really go wrong if you just copy their daylight cycle hey so Food. So with food, um, I feed them daily when it's spring and summer and um, just if they're really active then they're going to be eating more and they do get really active in the springtime. They will, they're really good at managing their own weight in general. Um, so unlike a bearded dragon that will just get obese if you let them eat whatever they want. With these guys, I guess because in the wild like they, with their body shape they kind of need to be agile. 
and climb and jump and if they get really fat they can't really do those things very well so once they start getting a bit chubby they usually just lessen their appetite the only time that doesn't happen is when they're getting intentionally chubby for when they're gonna brumate and things like that or luna will get really really chubby basically all year she tries to get chubby because she's used to breeding and so when she is breeding then she loses that weight again and it evens itself out um with sol he just manages his own weight year round um he's never caused me any concern for gaining too much weight even eating whatever he wants all the time i find that they will eat literally anything insect related um including stuff that isn't insects too they I think I usually use, at the minute, it's mostly Mario worms and locusts and some roaches that I breed. Um, they seem to really love locusts, but um, they will eat, I mean, a mix of extra isopods that live in there, um, even earthworms to some degree, which are also in there. Um, they'll eat snails too, but Personally, I don't find that they're that big of a fan of them, um, but they can eat them and they're pretty entertaining to watch when they're eating them because they'll break the shells off and everything before eating them. Um, they, I've tried tin snails as well, they weren't a huge fan. Um, dust all of it with some calcium vitamin powder that I'll put on the screen. Um, I use a lot of dog food bowls as well, um, just because it's a lot easier to just pop Mario worms or mealworms in there um, and they can't really escape from them like they can from the escape proof reptile specific bowls which I find everything just comes out of. They will also like forage, they're really good with foraging things. Um, they can like hear when there's a Mario worm under the soil and they'll dig it all out and everything. I'm pretty sure that's why Luna digs that plant out because it's like on the hot side and so all the Mario worms are probably underneath it. So I'll put like quite a few in the bowl and then some of them on the soil for them to try and get. Um, I'm not, part of why I use the bowls is because it's just easier to then see if they've eaten all of it or not. Um, so if it was all in the soil then I would have to keep a lot more track of you know whether I need to add more it's kind of harder to tell um, if you don't have a bioactive tank then you can just put them in in a bowl or a tub and then just add some leaf litter and things so that they're still foraging because they do really enjoy that even like hatchlings will forage a bit in the bowls um, they seem to enjoy it so the non-insect stuff that they will eat is I mean, it depends on the particular lizard. I've had one that even ate bell pepper. Um, but these two will eat any fruits and berries. They'll give that a try. Um, in the wild, during autumn, especially like up to 10% of their diet can be like just fruit. So they do seem to like fruit, but it's not absolutely necessary that they have it. Um, they like dandelions, even dandelion leaves. Um, I also do offer them like random fruit and vegetables and any safe flowers that I have found. Um, generally if it's safe for a tortoise to eat then it's safe for them to eat. Um, and even if they don't eat it, it's like they'll still investigate it, they'll try and figure out what it is um, and it's just a little bit of enrichment for them. And then whatever they don't eat, their insects will eat it anyway. To feed the insects. I use mostly carrots for like Mario worms and roaches and stuff um, just because they're really cheap and they take a while to mould. I mean the locusts and stuff will only eat grass and cabbage so they still get variety that way and I'll add in random food scraps too um, to try and mix it up a bit so that they get variety in their insects and their insects get variety because whatever the insects are eating they'll end up eating too. I try and keep it between 40 and 60 percent humidity which is already what my country tends to be anyway um it does vary because 
overnight it'll end up where the substrate releases a lot of the humidity and it rises which is also what happens in the wild and then once the humid once the lights come on the humidity will kind of decrease again i try and keep some moist hides around so that if they're shedding they can just go in um by moist hides i usually just end up like sticking like a bunch of moss in the substrate like with a rock on the top and then they will just dig into that moister area when they want to um so you're really distracting but like i can't say no to you either <laughs> oh god is luna gonna join me now Um, for substrate, I cut this tank because I can't really put a proper drainage layer in because they'll dig it out. Um, so what I did instead was just put a big layer of perlite. So it was like an inch of perlite. And then I just put the rest of the substrate on the top. And it will gradually get mixed together, but that's fine. Um, I can always just, in a few years, take all the substrate out, put another big layer of perlite in, kind of reset it all. Um, the rest of the substrate is mostly just organic soil from garden shop. Then I've got some like orchard bark in as well. I was meaning to add sand and I forgot, so I'm gonna add that the next time I have to dig through all the soil looking for eggs. The sand mostly just helps with holding the burrows because they do build entire networks and chambers and burrows underground. Like it's just easier if it's gonna hold and keep all of those burrows. Like if a burrow collapses, they don't seem to really particularly mind. They'll just dig their way back out. It's not the end of the world. They, they are smart, they're really good at digging, so it's not any big issue for them. The other thing that I mixed in with these is um, I had some crab shells from my work that I cleaned out and I just crushed them up and I mixed them through because as like a source of calcium for the isopods, um, it's not important for the actual lizards. It's just for the isopods so that they have some calcium. They also have loads of leaf litter that was originally on the top. There's loads of it like inside of the big bark tube. So that's mostly just for the isopods to eat and nibble and whatnot. Substrate that I have used in the past and I wouldn't recommend is the very sandy, dusty substrates that are marketed for bearded dragons. Um, I found that it just made them sneeze loads because it kicked up so much dust. Like so much that I would have to hoover the room more regularly. There'd be a layer of dust on everything. Um, but I guess that's just because they're a lot more aggressive diggers than beta dragons are. Um, the other one is cocoa fiber seems to dry out very fast and then when it does it gets really dusty as well. So I don't use that anymore. Um, and so really I just find that general normal soil works the best for me and it's also the cheapest. So for cohabitation, it kind of just needs its whole separate video because it's pretty complicated and like it shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, generally, if you want to have multiple assertors, then I always recommend having multiple tanks for them um, because Sol and Luna, they get along really well together during spring and summer and then the rest of the year they do not get along well together. I mean, that all of their social language and their body language and stuff like that takes a lot of time to try and learn. Um, if you are keeping them together then what I've found really helpful is motion detection security cameras um, so that you can see how they act when you're not around just in case there is any fighting that you're missing. Um, they obviously do well cohabitating if you're breeding them, but I have kept them together even for not breeding. Like I had two sisters that were born last year and they for some reason just got on really well together. They never had any issues. And then you get the individuals who once they reached puberty, they were like, they, they just chased any other lacerta 
Um, so it really depends. It depends on so many factors. Um, but having an extra setup there just means that if any fighting does happen, which it can happen really suddenly, um, it's a lot less stress for you to be able to just separate them. Um, it's also a lot less stress for them because sometimes it's not obvious that they're not getting along. It's more of an accumulation of very subtle bullying. Um, so when that happens, like, you know, it's just best to have the option of separating them so that one doesn't just gradually lose weight and health and everything. Thank you very much for watching. Um, if there's anything that I've missed, which there will be things, plenty of things I've missed out, then um, comments and everything are welcome. Like, I like chatting about wizards, anything wizard related, I like answering questions, so everybody is welcome. Um, whether you've had a wizard before, whether you're planning to have one, whether you're an expert on them, I'd like to hear from anyone really. Um, this is also my cat Loki who really likes coming in the garage to sniff everything, but he's scared of bullsitters for some reason. And bullsitters for some reason aren't scared of him, which I was surprised about. But of course you will never go near them, will you? Because you are a hunter. But 